Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am here today with John Gold from Hyped It. He is an independent artist, and what I love about what he's done with Hyped It is he created something out of his own need. And of course, then, you know, as he had that need, of course, many of you will have the same need. And that's why what he's got is really going to be helpful for you guys in building your fan base. But before we get into everything that Hyped It does and how it can help you, um, I'd love to know, John, just like a little bit about your background, how you got into music, uh, what you've done in music and how you ended up deciding to go for really starting like a whole new company with Hyped It. Awesome. Bree, thank you so much for having me. Um, This is awesome and uh, excited to talk to you and share some of my story. I've been a musician, I think, as long as I can think, pretty much. Uh, I started uh, learning the piano and then later the drums. Um, Piano more because my parents wanted it, drums because I wanted it. (laughs) And um, funny enough, today I make all piano house music. So I kind of brought together the rhythmic elements from the drums with the uh, the piano that was initially forced on me. And then um, I guess, you know, something I did fall in love with a bit. Um, and uh, I've been releasing music since my high school days, really. Um, I got lucky early on. One of my first tracks that finally had reached sort of a level of quality where you could put it out was picked up by a record label in Germany, they put it out, it became a little bit of a a club hit. And uh, that caught the attention of other record labels. So it became pretty easy to release music. I uh, was eventually signed to Warner, I made music exclusively for them for a few years. And that was a time when you have all these electronic dance music compilations. So they were looking for a lot of content to put out on compilations, because people were still buying um, a lot of these compilation CDs. And that was fun as long as it lasted because it didn't last very long. (laughs) Uh, When my contract came up for renewal, they called me in and sit me down and told me that they were going to drop me from the roster. And it was it was like a shock. I didn't know where it was coming from. I had always focused on making high quality music. I had built up my studio, you know, created better music, put more energy, more time into music. And I thought I was on sort of the right track to Uh, built myself as a music artist but it turned out that what they were looking for at the time was what I was looking for I had invested all my time and energy into making better music and what they were looking for at the time were artists who had invested in their fan base so they had something to monetize obviously the the business model in the music industry changed right it was initially was all touring and playing for a little money or for free in order to promote your music and your CD. So people would hear in a show and then they would go out and buy your music. And that was the revenue model. And then obviously these days it's flipped upside down. Your music is pretty much free. It's all about selling experiences like, you know, shows or other things that you can offer to your audiences. Um, And there was a period in between where neither of these worked. (laughs) Uh, So that was a little challenging, but anyway, for me, this was a wake up call. Um, where I was like, holy shit, I, the record labels, they, they don't just want quality music. They want you to have a fan base. Um, that's part of the business model of being successful as a musician. I had done none of this and I needed to start to do that. And this is sort of what set me up on the, the journey that eventually became, um, you know, hyped it and how I'm building my music business these days. And, you know, I'm sure we're going to dive a little bit deeper into this, but in a nutshell, uh, that was sort of the starting point. 
Mm, yeah, that's really interesting. So what happened in that in-between period? Was that kind of when people were selling downloads for 99 cents and that kind of thing where you weren't making a ton of money on the music and you weren't, they, they weren't like monetizing experiences yet? Well, it was kind of a time when the venues hadn't figured out really how to monetize yet. Mm -hmm. And Napster had MP3s readily available oh, for yes. you online. So that was a little that was a little rough period. Um, you know, luckily I was a, I was still a student at the time, so I didn't depend on a musical income. Yeah, I mean, it was just you know as the as the industry had to reorganize itself um, and had to go through these couple of years, I guess. Yep, that makes sense. So when you first started embarking on trying to build your fan base what did you first try and like what did you find to be the the most difficult part of it or like the obstacles that you experienced yeah i mean there there are kind of two things that guide a lot of the stuff that i do and one is i look at what everybody else is doing and oftentimes i ask myself is that really the right way to do it just because everybody else does it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to do it it's the best way to blend in if you do what everybody else does, but blending in might not always be what gets you the best result. And the other thing is I put myself in the shoes of a fan, because if you can put yourself in the shoes of a fan and look at it from their perspective, you can deliver better experiences to your fans, which also helps you with your results. And I was looking at a marketplace or in an industry where obviously there were you know, millions of independent music artists, everybody fighting for attention online, everybody trying to get fans. And they all kind of did it the same way. They posted their music and then they would blast social media and emails and was all, hey, my new track is out, click here. Hey, my new album is out, you know, click here, listen to it. And everybody just trying to get the click over to their music. And fans don't actually need that much new music as it's being released. It's a sad truth from my perspective, but I think there are more independent music artists fighting for attention online than fans are out there trying to discover new music. I think you'll see that a lot of people who consume music, they have you know a couple of favorites, they have playlists that have music that they stream over and over again. But with a million songs on Spotify new every month, there isn't that much demand for new music um, from a wide audience. So it's all the game for attention. If everybody is just waving their hands and saying, hey, my music's out, come here, come here, click, click, click. How can you do better than that? And so this is when I thought, well, I don't want to do just the same thing. What can I do to stand out and to offer fans something that maybe has them up into my music as opposed to somebody else? Instead of screaming the loudest, how can I make them a better offer? And my initial idea was, well, I'm trying to grow a fan base, a fan base that can mean followers, that means email addresses these days in particular, because it's a fan base where you control the communication, which I think is really important. And what if I invite somebody to come into my world and the first thing I do is I offer them a little gift. And in my case, initially, that was a download of my music. So I literally went on SoundCloud and posted a new song and instead of blasting all over the place, you know, hey, come over, play this, I put into the title and into the description of the track that if somebody um, engaged with the track, like reposted or liked or followed me, I would give them, I would DM them on SoundCloud and send them a free download of the track. It was sort of my way of saying, hey, if you engage with my music, uh, there's an instant reward, there's instant gratification for you instead of just the music. I'll, I'll send you something, I'll give you a gift, I offer you something special. And uh, to my surprise, that was pretty successful. Like a lot of people came over, engaged with the music, reposted it on SoundCloud, that was super valuable because the repost would put that same offer in front of more fans mm -hmm. who then also saw it. So it helped the virality of the track and the spread and eventually the the challenge that i faced is that i had so many people engaging with this that it took me like an hour at night um, to just dm everybody and send out these download links and things like that and well, this that's is a good I problem said, well, to that. have i always tell my my students you know let's come up with something that's going to be exciting to people 
And let's make it totally unscalable at first, because let's be honest, you're only getting one or two new people a day or a few new people a week. Eventually, when you get to the point where you it, it's not scalable to do it anymore, then we'll come up with something else. But like at first, you can totally dazzle people by actually, you know, even sending them like a personalized video or something like that. Right. So let's put this into context. This this uh, SoundCloud experiment that you did, what what a year was this? Uh, that was 2014. Okay. So yeah, basically back then giving away a free song really worked, right? But I feel like it doesn't work nearly as well in 2022. And I was just having this conversation with my students the other day, and we were brainstorming other things that you could give to get people excited to join your email list or share or that kind of thing. And so what, what do you think? Like what what has been the evolution of that kind of like free gift thing over the years? Um, yeah, so uh, great point. So let me let me let me connect this into the the conversation that we're having. So um, just quickly to wrap up sort of the 2014, the the fact that I ran into this problem of having to manually DM hundreds of people and it taking away time that I wanted to spend making music, right, and coming up with with new marketing ideas, that was the that was the that's what sparked the development of Hyped It because I figured there must be a better way. There must be I'm there must be a tool to do this, and I searched. I couldn't find a tool that did that. And this is when I went out and started to develop this piece of software that did just that, reward fans with the with an instant download for the engagement that they would share with the music. So that's where the platform was born. But as you point out, over time, music downloads have lost some of their value, at least to a broader audience. They are still music genres where a download is extremely valuable. Anything in the electronic music space where you have a lot of DJs collecting music, downloads are still you know, top of the game because everybody wants them for their DJ sets, those kinds of things. But two things have happened. First of all, the framework, the idea behind it is as valid now as it was in 2014. It's not about the, it's not about the download of the music. The idea is, to allow a fan to experience that instant gratification, that little bit of an extra when they join your world for the first time. Yeah, I totally and, agree with that. I, I'm on board. Like, yes, that that that's a good point of saying like, just because music downloads don't necessarily work in particular genres anymore, it doesn't mean that this whole framework isn't absolutely valid. Yeah, so the question then is, what is that exclusive that, can say no offer that you can make a fan to come into your world. What is that in your particular music genre? For somebody, it might be a music download. For somebody else, it could be something that is related to the lyrics of the song, maybe a lyrics booklet, beautifully visualized. For somebody else, it might be the beats out of which the song was built for somebody else to jam on. Um, it could be an exclusive access to an unreleased music video. So this is where the gate technology obviously evolved, where these days it's not just about um, adding music to it. You can add any piece of content to one of those tools, and it doesn't even have to be downloadable content. It can be just exclusive access to content like an unreleased music video. So this is where art and science meet a little bit, right? The science part is, well, if you make a better offer, you know it's a great way to attract fans and to, to attract attention for your music and to get them to engage, to get them to come into your world, um, ideally even to share an email address so you can build that relationship. The art piece is, well, what is that, what's that thing that your audience, fans in your genre, they, they can't resist. When they see that you're offering this, they just want to engage, right? They just want to, um, they just want to have it. And for some artists that might be music download, for somebody else, it could be something completely different. So that is how you have the, the pulse on your audience, on your genre, and you can see what's out there and what others are doing. And even, you know, survey your audience, ask questions on social media, test things. Testing is so easy these days. You can just create one of those gates in a couple of minutes, put it online. If people don't engage, well, maybe that wasn't the right, the right thing that you offer. Um, 
and then uh, you know just try something else and see what works it's uh, as all marketing it's an iterative process where you just you know test things and some things work really well and some others don't and you keep doing more of the things that work really well and you stop doing some of the things that don't work so well and that's that's sort of you know progress yeah absolutely and i mean i think you know, just as you said, testing out things, I think sometimes we feel like, oh, we failed if like we put something out there and it didn't go over like we wanted. No, we just figured out that wasn't the thing that they wanted. They want something else. So, you know, I, even some ideas just came to me now, you know, maybe you did a private live stream once a month for the people that join your list or do what you want them to do. Or maybe you uh, give them the sheet music to one of your songs or you give them a backing track, you know, if it's in your genre. Like I know in like maybe the Christian genre, a lot of people like want to sing these songs at events or like sing them at home and, you know, they could have a backing track for it. So it's, it's about getting creative and brainstorming, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I think there is actually one use of a free download that is still valuable pretty universally across genres. And this is around pre-saves. So pre-saves obviously pretty something that grew to popularity over the last few years so it's more recent but if you think about most standard pre-saves i i kind of look at them almost like calendar invites uh, a fan clicks a couple buttons they have to authorize access to spotify and once they execute the pre-save on the pre-save page they don't really get anything out of it for the fan it is all the reward is in the future if you even can call that a reward that you are able to put your song into their liked songs playlist on Spotify. I wouldn't even call that a reward to the fan because the fan, if they are, look, if they are tuned into you, they know on release day, you're going to send another email to them and with a link to Spotify. So there is really very little reason for a fan to pre-save your song because there's so little value in it for them. The value is all for you as an artist, but not really for the fan. And so using a gate that has music attached to it in order to do a pre-save rather than a smart link pre-save that is a whole game changer because now you can go out to your audience and say hey you can enjoy this track four weeks before anybody else can and here's the pre-save so now what happens is you get the same pre-save but the fan gets the song right away so they can enjoy this early before anybody else and the benefit here is about this exclusive access. It's it's still not necessarily about owning music. They don't need to own the MP3, but the fact that they can enjoy your song four weeks before the rest of the world can, that has some real value. And this is um, a great incentive and a great way to use music as an incentive to get uh, fans to engage with you on a pre-save, for example. That's a really good... I love that idea. And, you know, most fans, I think, don't think about it. I, well, I was trying to remind I'm not sorry, not most fans, most artists don't think about it in that, like, basically you're asking them a pretty big favor to do a pre-save for you because it's really all about what you're getting out of it. They're not really getting much, as you said, they'll probably, if they follow you on Spotify anyway, they'll probably see it in the release radar, you know, Exactly, or like, 100%. as you said, if they're on your email list, you hopefully, if you're doing a good job with your marketing, you're going to send it out on its release day. So how, how do you, how do they get delivery of this song, say four weeks in advance? Do they get access to a way to like stream it or are they downloading it? They're downloading it. Okay. <clears throat> they don't, that's what the, that's what the hyped it platform. So the technology that I built does instantly. So it basically creates a little mini page for you where the fan logs in. It's the same authentication process with Spotify that you have on a regular pre-save, just on a regular pre-save page, you know, the last page would just say, thank you for pre-saving it. And there wouldn't be anything else for the fan to do other than close the browser window and leave. In this particular case, the fan gets the download of the song so they can start playing it. And the nice thing is, you know, oftentimes I get this question, well, John, if I give away that download four weeks before the release, am I still going to get streams? Aren't I'm going <clears> to <throat> uh, cannibalizing the streams on Spotify? And the thing is that from what I see, you don't. No. Because it's not. just because somebody has the MP3 doesn't mean that they change up their music listening habits. Let's and be honest, somebody... it's not convenient, right? Convenient exactly. is if you're a listener on Spotify, 
and the song comes out, you're going to put it in your playlist so you can listen to it easily wherever you want. I mean, I, I am a Spotify consumer and I certainly, I wouldn't be like, oh, I have this on my phone somewhere. I'm not going to add it to my playlist, you know? Exactly. So that, and that's where, that's where this makes so much sense because you're getting, you're getting a, a lot higher conversion on pre-saves. I've actually, when I come up with ideas like this, I usually put it to the test. So in this particular case, when I first started um, toying around with this, I literally ran a campaign to a cold audience that was using Facebook and Instagram ad, a campaign for the exact same song at the exact same time for the exact same budget, just one ad driving the traffic to a regular pre-save, like the ones we've all seen, which is basically a smart link in a pre-save state. And the other one to a gate that has the pre-save <laughs> built in, but rewards the fan with the download. And on the same budget, I got literally twice the number of pre-saves just by offering the music as an instant reward. And that shows you the power of that additional um, incentive that you're putting out there. Um, and Let me ask you said, real quick, you know, if you're giving that, if you're sending that to a cold audience that don't know you yet, what are you saying to get them excited enough about it to actually opt in? You want to let them know that there is a that there's early access to an unreleased song that they can get. So the in this case, the ad has to describe the benefits so that they are not um, so that they already know what's in it for them by going to the page. So the ad would say something along the lines of, um, um, you know, my new my new piano house track, you know, drops in four weeks. Um, here's an exclusive download uh, available right now. And I'm going to take it down mm -hmm. on release day. So I add some scarcity to it to let people know that this is only available up until the release date. Then they can check it out on Spotify if they like. Um, and, you know, in the ad, I'll refine the language a little bit <laughs> compared to what I, you know, just uh, of course, <clears throat> you know, spoke out. but it's it's something along those lines. And then the ad will have a video that is a 30 second preview of the song. So the video will deliver, the video is just gonna be the cover art of the song. So I don't do music videos for these ads, it's just gonna be the cover art. It's gonna play 30 second preview of the song. And the, the text in the ad will describe that there is the song that isn't live yet, uh, is exclusive, is available for download. So instant consumption. Um, and this whole thing will go away at a specific date. Got it. That's that's really smart. And it's really smart to have a sample of the song because a lot of times I see artists putting out maybe like an image, you know, and so it's like they don't know what the song sounds like until they go to the page and what's going to make them click off of Facebook or Instagram and go to that page. They, it needs to be super compelling. And if these are if this is cold traffic, they don't they don't know you. So you're obviously probably targeting people that already like house music or electronic music. Um, and, and that's important, but like, are you giving them any context as far as like my music sounds similar to this person or this person, or are you just assuming that they're going to click the play button and listen for themselves? The context happens through the Facebook and Instagram targeting. So I might use sound alike artists or niche genre interests for the targeting, but I don't describe more of that in the ad itself it's the 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 preview is so readily available because facebook displays that video with the big play button um that i before somebody has read any of that description they will have already played the video because that's usually how the browsing experience works on a device mm. right people scroll through it they see an image or video that that looks interesting they they play it and if that resonates with them, then they're like, oh, let me see the description. Let me dive a little bit deeper. So um, I think somebody will always listen to the preview first. That will make them decide, hey, I like that or I don't like it. And if they didn't like it, the description is not going to much change their mind because they've already browsed on. Um, so the text will only increase their desire after they've already listened to it. And this is what I'm doing in the description by letting them know, hey, you like the song. Did you know that was actually you know, exclusive and you can only get it right now. And this whole thing will go away at a certain point in time. Um, that's how sort of the psychology plays out. Got it. No, really smart, very smart. Um, so let me let me <laughs> play de devil's advocate for a minute. Sure. And just, so 
how is this better than just like maybe making a landing page using your email software or something? And you can, you know, you can certainly deliver a free download that way as well. What does Hyped It have that is really focused on the musician market? Well, if your if your goal is to just capture an email address, technically you could just do this with an email client, but you wouldn't get a pre-safe out of this. So, I mean, in the example that we're talking about, so the way hyped it work, hyped it, hyped it is a hyped it allows you to build these gate pages that are made specifically for music. Hyped it has no other purpose than helping music artists. So there is a prominent display of the cover art. There's a play button on the cover art that allows visitors to play a preview of the song. And then you decide what kind of benefits you're asking from a fan in order to access and unlock whatever the gift or the reward or the exclusive access is that you have. And this is when you can pick email capture as one, but you can pick anything related to Spotify, to Apple Music, to Deezer, to um yeah, yeah to Twitter, to Facebook, to Instagram, to YouTube. I mean, there's just a long list um, of platforms that we integrate with so if you want to grow youtube subscribers well you know you set it up like that if you want to go spotify if you want to grow spotify pre-safe well you implement that if you want to get soundcloud repost well you do that so it's the the tool is really versatile and you customize it to whatever you want to get in return for sharing whatever it is that you're sharing with your audience very cool no i love that I love that. And that makes a lot of sense. And it is, it, it's always easier to use something that's designed for what you want to do and instead of to try to like, you know, cobble together something that's like way more general, like I was mentioning with a landing page where you have to like kind of build everything out. It's just so much easier to have it all there and just click a few buttons and upload a few things and you're all good. And I love that you can get used YouTube subscribers and shares and all those things. Um, really, really great use cases. So let me ask you another thing. I know that I've mentioned on the show in the past, show.co. How is that similar or different from what Hyped It does? I, I believe show.co is just a smart link, isn't it? I believe you can do some of the things that you're mentioning, but I don't know. Yeah. What, what does a smart link actually mean? So the this, this smart link are, are these mini distribution pages that you see where an artist will share a link to their music, but instead of getting you directly to the song, it'll land you on a page that says, you know, stream this on Spotify or stream uh, this on Apple so Music. Like, or give them the choices of where they want to go. Yeah, it has all the list of different um, of different services, music services that you want to show. Um, and the way most of these platforms work and Hyped It has smart links as well. So, I mean, Hyped is really a toolbox. I know we've talked a lot about Gates, but... There, there is, there are more tools under the hood. Gates are, you know, one of the primary tools and where it's all started, but um, smart links, regular pre-saves, all of those tools are also available on the platform. And the way this usually works is that you, you just have to have one source URL for your song, and then it automatically goes out and finds your music on all these other platforms and builds one of these mini landing pages for you automatically so oh, that's really cool so i don't have to go find my apple link and my you know all the links that's true you don't now it was i mean most of these smartening services work that way hyped it works that way but i'm sure show.co you know does it the same way and there are others um so uh there isn't that much that much difference i guess between these different platforms um work where i think hyped it is different a little bit just based on its origins is that I'm a music artist and most of the members on our team are music artists. Um, so what we do often comes out of our own needs. So for example, when, you know, we, we had hyped it collecting all these fan email addresses, one of the pain points became, well, we're not going to, we want to send emails out of MailChimp, out of SendinBlue and out of these other platforms. So how are we syncing this up? So like, you know, we build tools that sync it up automatically. So then whenever somebody, when a fan leaves an email address on your gate to unlock any of your rewards, that email address automatically flows, flows through into email marketing software. So, oh, so that is that a direct integration or do you have to use something like Zapier? 
uh, we support Zapier, if this and that, and um, one other platform. So it uses one of these automation tools. Got it. And uh, or for example, a lot of musicians have started to experiment with Instagram ads, with Facebook ads, with Google ads on YouTube. And so we developed all these pixel integrations. We developed custom events that are being sent in the background between these platforms or in Facebook did the iOS 14 update. We implemented the conversion API into Hypedit because you know, I run ads for my music. So whenever there's something that I need and other artists uh, on our team need, you know, that's an indicator that the broader community needs the same tools as well. Mm. And then we build it in. So um, it all comes very much out of the experience of music marketing, just because of our own backgrounds. Yeah, I love that. You guys are testing everything. You're seeing what works. You're seeing where the holes are and the gaps that you can fill. And that's, that is very, very valuable. And I love working with music companies that are comprised of a bunch of musicians that know exactly the pain points of musicians. Yeah, we use it. I mean, we're the guinea pigs and the end users at the same time. <laughs> yep. So are there um, other tools that we didn't cover in the in the toolbox that you want to highlight? No, you know, I hyped it is really versatile. So I, sometimes I get this question, what's the best way to use hyped it? And I wish there was a 30 second elevator pitch kind of answer that I had, mm -hmm. but there really isn't. And the reason is that everybody has a different goal and has a different outcome. So usually when somebody asks me, what's the best way to use hyped it? I ask them a question back, which is, what, what are you trying to get out of it? Are you, oh, oh, what, what's the next goal that you're trying to accomplish? Let's say somebody has a new release. Um, are you trying to maximize pre-saves? Are you trying to maximize listeners and streams? Maybe you're maximizing the, your, the list of the, uh, the growth of your email list instead. What's the number one goal that you have for this particular release? When that happens, you would say, okay, that was a success. I'm happy that was successful. Because um, sometimes you, you know, have musicians and they say, well, my goal is, I just want this release to blow up. I want this to become popular. <laughs> And those are hard goals to take an action on because you can't really measure them. They can't be quantified. And if you can't measure or quantify it or define it better, it's very hard to even come up with a strategy to get to that goal. Um, but the moment you make that mental switch and like, I know exactly what I want, right? I want the first week, I want to hit 10,000 streams on that release. Well, that's a goal we can work with, right? Because now we can measure it. We know exactly what kind of metric you're trying to drive. Or if you'd say on this release, I want to at least add a thousand fans to my email list. Okay, we can take action on that. So then once you have that decided, it's very easy then to go into Hypedit and set up the, the software to work in your favor. For example, if it's all about emails, you build a gate and you focus everything on that email capture step. If you want to get a different result, you focus anything on that step. And this is obviously where you know me and our support team are always available every day to help with questions like that. And we love getting those emails, by the way, if somebody's like, hey, you know, I have a new release coming up in two weeks, I'm trying to do this and that, how would you do it? Um, because we are music artists ourselves and we work with all these tools, the, the way we wanna help the community is not just by saying, you know, hey, if you wanna update your credit card information, I can help <laughs> you with that, but I can help you with marketing. No, like, you know, we wanna help you get to those musical goals. Um, that's sort of the first, uh, that's gonna be the first level of discussion uh, that we wanna have, which is obviously the same, the same mentality and passion that, that's driven me to develop other training programs and things that have, you know, grown out of Hyped It, uh, just to help music artists build their, build their campaigns two specific goals. I love that perspective. Cause a lot of times, like you said, they say, oh, I just want it to blow up or, you know, there's nothing measurable that they're really going for, or yet they, or they want to do all the things, you know, I want to grow my email list and my YouTube scribe subscribers and my, you know, Instagram and all the things and get pre-saves. Like you cannot successfully do all of those things at once. So very good point that you're making that like, what is the goal of this release? Usually you want like one major goal or you could have two if like you wanted pre-saves first and then, you know, once it was released, you wanted something else. Um, but yeah, like it's just getting people to focus and 
really go in all in on one direction, which is yeah. what I find to be the hardest thing to get musicians to do. And I, I can really appreciate the, this mindset of, hey, I want it to happen all at the same time, right? We're so passionate about our music. Whenever I have a new song out, that is like one of the greatest song I, <laughs> in that moment in time. And I'm sure it's sort of the same for everybody. And you're just so passionate about it. You want it to be heard and experienced on all these different platforms. Now, there is a little mini strategy that I use to grow everywhere. Basically, It's not everywhere at the same time, but it allows you to grow everywhere. And it's really, really simple. And it starts by saying, okay, if I want to grow everywhere, the, the number one item or the number one metric that I want to watch is the, the email subscribers that I have. Because if you grow your email subscribers, you have an ability to communicate with your audience whenever you want, whenever you have new music out or other stories to share. And you can always link this to other platforms. And in a very simple way, let's say you have 12 releases coming out over the next 12 months, right? A song a month. And you want to do a pre-save for each of those songs in the way we talked about earlier, where it's just a gate, the song, exclusive access, maybe two weeks, three weeks early. That's 12 emails that you can send to your audience over the next year. That is 12 gates that you can send to that audience. That gate on any of those email on any of those emails does not need the fan email capture step because you already have them on your email address. So you can swap that with anything else. I would do, you know, Spotify pre-save, and then you could add a YouTube subscribe to one of them. You could add an Instagram follow to the next one. You could add, um, you know, a Bandcamp follow to the next. Like you decide what you want, but the moment you have the ability to communicate with your audience over and over again, and by using tools that help fans to easily connect with you on different platforms. And if your mindset is, hey, I'm gonna give them something for that. I come up with these ideas of giving, them, uh, of giving them early access to my music or early access to a music video, again, whatever best resonates with your audience, you can connect them to all these places and you will see all of those places grow at the same time. That's why email, oftentimes email doesn't sound sexy, People are like, ah, you know, I want a million streams. I want a million listeners. I want a million followers on Instagram. Um, I have hardly anybody heard say, you know, I want a million email addresses. I mean, obviously that would be an insane. Me, I'm number. raising my hand. I want, yeah. I do. <laughs> but, because but, I understand the power of it. It's so powerful because it really helps you to push that growth into any other platform that you want. You want to, you want to grow a playlist on Spotify while well, promote it to your email list, right? You want to grow listeners and streams on Spotify? Well, your email list is the launch for every new release, right? To push the first couple hundred or first couple thousand fans over there. So even though it's not really sexy, it is really powerful. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And earlier when you said like, if an artist had a, a goal of 10,000 streams on Spotify, I was feeling like, oh, I would never choose that one, right? Because I want a way to continue to be connected to them. And listens on Spotify, like, yeah, maybe they'll show them some of your new releases or your older releases inside of their Discover Weekly or, you know, release radar, but like, they might not, you know, but in if you're connected through email specifically, and secondarily through things like YouTube or, or other social media, at least you're going to be able to continue to communicate with them. So I, I, I'm glad that we had that that conversation, because I am a huge from a proponent of email and it is definitely not dead. It's alive and well. It's alive and well. And, and it's one of the easiest ways for us to build revenue streams as well, whether it is selling merchandise, whether you are trying to grow on Patreon or, um, you know, even if you try to sell tickets to shows, the email address and the email list is always the foundation for all of these activities. So um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan, <laughs> a big email fan. Me too. Me too. Okay. So let's, how would they get started with hyped it? Like, do you have like different levels of pricing? Uh, no, it's very simple. It's $9 a month on our pro membership. Um, there is a, there's a free way to try out hyped it just to feel it out and then to unlock all the features. Um, it's just a simple $9 a month membership. So very straightforward. That is very straightforward and very affordable. 
from musicians for musicians. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, is there anything else we didn't cover today that you wanted to mention? Now, I think we cover a lot of ground and I absolutely love it. My mission and our mission is to help other independent music artists because we're all part of that same community. And so there's a couple ways to connect. Uh, there's a hyped it Facebook group. Um, so if anyone uh, here is an independent music artist, may have some questions about any of the content that we discussed, you know, that's a great way to post questions and get some answers. And, um, and then also we're always just a message away. There is on the hyped it homepage, right? H Y P E double D I T dot com. There is a support link that allows you to send any kind of questions to our team and get help with, uh, with both strategy and technical questions related to hyped it. So if you have a new release coming up, or you want to try one of those pre-saves or anything that we talked about here um, and anybody wants to dive deeper, we're always there to help. That's so fantastic because you're not just providing the tools, you're actually helping people know exactly how to use them. So I really appreciate that about what you guys are doing. Thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. I know that everything that we discuss is going to be super helpful to our audience. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.